ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة ما خاب والله من تمسك بكم وأمنا من لجأ والتجأ إليكم يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وكذلك جعلناكم أمة وسطا لتكونوا على الناس شهيدا So when you're gathering with a loud remembrance upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad As a gift to the soul of Sayyidi wa Mawlai Abdullah al-Radhi' recite the second salawat As a gift to the soul of Sayyidi wa Mawlai Aba Abdullah al Hussein, recite the third salawat with the loudest of your voices. <laughs> Since the inception of Islam in the Arabian Peninsula, those who embraced the religion of Islam were known to be as one unit and one family. Every Muslim brother, every Muslim believer, and every Muslim mu'min, and every Muslim mu'minah are recognized to be brothers and sisters in faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the Holy Quran states, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما المؤمنون إخوة The mu'mineen, the believers are brothers And in a very famous line of poetry Allama Iqbal Lahuri states أضحى الإسلام لنا دينا وجميع الكون لنا وطنا He says that this entire universe belongs to one family who attributes itself to the religion of Islam. Meaning Islam is colorblind. Islam does not see our color, our nation, our nationality, our language. But those who attribute themselves to Islam become brothers in faith. And this was the task of Rasulullah. His major task was to be able to bring the Abyssinian Bilal and the Persian Salman and the Qurashi Hamza and to bring them into one family and to turn them into brothers. And this was not an easy task. For they all had different cultures and different rituals and they came from different backgrounds. And of course, by living amongst one another, they at many times experienced the culture clash. And as Islam was expanding, as new nations and nationalities embraced the religion of Islam, this culture clash 
would even become greater amongst the Muslims. And even after the demise of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, as Islam reached the shores of many different countries, this culture clash could have become greater and greater. But Rasulullah chose to eliminate this culture clash through his art. Rasulullah did not come to abolish cultures. But Rasulullah came and he honored what was good within every culture. And Rasulullah came to eliminate from the life of Muslims that ritual or culture which was against the Islamic teachings. And of course, the Arabs, within their culture, they had certain good things. Part of their culture had some good teachings and good rituals. Amongst the good rituals and practices in the Arabian Peninsula, before the birth of Islam, was the fact that the Arabs chose to honor their guests. The Arabs chose to honor their guests. So if a person received a guest, then he's ought to do everything in his hand to honor that guest. And Rasulullah came and not only blessed this notion, but he made this notion, he made this principle an Islamic principle. Therefore Rasulullah, in a very famous tradition states, الضيف حبيب الله The guest is the beloved of Allah. يأتي برزقه He comes with his own rizq, with his own sustenance. يأتي برزقه ويخرج بذنوب أهل الدار And when he leaves, he leaves with the sins of the household. Forgiving their sins. Another that was part of the Arabian culture was Ashhur al Haram, the sacred months. The month of Rajab, the month of the Al Qa'dah, the month of the Al Hijjah, and the month of Muharram. Those four months out of the year, the Arabs would not engage in war, they would not engage in battle. There would be peace in the Arabian Peninsula and amongst the Arabs. And Rasulullah came and he not only honored this practice, but he made it an Islamic practice. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of Ashhur al-Hurum within the Holy Qur'an. Another part of the culture of the Arabs was generosity. And they were known for their generosity. And Rasulullah not only came and he honored this practice, but Rasulullah told them that this practice is embedded within the teachings of Islam as well. Rasulullah in a very famous tradition stated, Al-Jawad or Al-Kareem or Al-Sakhi, the generous, Qareebun min Allah, is close to Allah. Wa Qareebun min Al-Nas, and he's close to the people. Wa Qareebun min Al-Jannah. And he is also close to paradise. And on the contrary, وَأَمَّا الْبَخِيلُ فَبَعِيدٌ مِنَ النَّاسِ And the Meisner is away from the people. وَبَعِيدٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ And he is away from Allah. وَبَعِيدٌ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ And he is away, and he is far away from paradise. And another tradition, Rasulullah says, أَنَّ السَّخِي يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةَ وَلَوْ بَعْدَ حِينَ The generous will enter paradise even after a long while of interrogation. Eventually Allah will give him the ultimate resting place, paradise. وَأَمَّا الْبَخِيلُ فَيَدْخُلُ النَّارَ وَلَوْ بَعْدَ حِينَ And the Meisner will never see paradise. In fact, Rasulullah says the Meisner not only does not enter paradise, but he cannot smell the scent of paradise. بَلْ لَا يَشُمُّ رَائِحَتُهَا Rasulullah, in a very famous tradition, 
teaches the youth to become generous. Many of us depend on the generosity of our fathers. Rasulullah says, no, teach yourself the habit of generosity. The habit to depart from your wealth, depart from the worldly belongings. So he says, in the shabu sakhi al murhaqu bidhunub. A young man that is drowning in sin. Drowning in sin. In the shab as sakhi al murhaqu bidhunub. He's fatigued himself with sin. It doesn't get worse than that. But if he is generous, Ahabu عند Allah is more beloved to Allah من الشيخ البخيل العابد قائما ليلة صائما نهارة. He is beloved to Allah than an elderly that has spent all his nights in salah and all his mornings in siyam. And Ahlul Bayt became the personification of generosity. Ahl al-Bayt illustrated and defined generosity to us. A lady comes to Fatima to Zahra on the night of her wedding. And she said to her, Ya bint Rasulullah, I want to come to your wedding. But I don't to wear, I don't have a dress. Would you be able to give me a dress? And Rasul and Fatima to Zahra had just worn her brand new wedding gown, wedding dress. So she said, yes, wait. She went inside and she gave her the brand new dress. Then she went and she wore her old dress. When Rasulullah was prepared to come and see his daughter to take her to the wedding, he saw that Fatima is wearing the old dress. So he said, Fatima... What happened to your new dress? She said, oh father, I gave it away to a poor girl who came asking for it. Rasulullah said, why didn't you give her the old dress? Fatima says, father, Allah and the Holy Quran says, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرِّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will not reach piety and righteousness unless you give from what you love the most. What you love the most. In a tradition, Fatima to Zahra calls on to Salman. She says, Salman, come. Salman comes. Assalamu alayki ya bint Rasulullah. She says, wa alayka assalamu ya am. She greets him back saying, oh uncle Salman, go and find my husband. So he said to her, why would your husband be in the masjid? Is there a problem? She said, no. Ali ibn Abi Talib was the official custodian of Fadak. And you know, Fadak was in the hands of Ahl al-Bayt for 10 years. In the hands of Fatima to Zahra for 10 years before the demise of Rasulullah. The official custodian of Fadak was whom? Imam Ali. And last year, I calculated the revenues of Fadak. What is equivalent in our time today, $2.4 million a month was the revenue of Fadak. Amir al muminin was the official custodian, so he would go and take the wealth from Fadak. So he said to her, Ya bint Rasulullah, so he's gone to Fadak, maybe he has not returned. She said, yes, I know he's back. But when Ali collects the revenues of Fadak, those who have loans come to him and he gives them. Those who want to purchase new homes, they come to him and he gives them. The orphans come to him and he gives them. The poor come to him and he gives them. And he has nothing now to bring home. So he is shy. Go and tell him to come back to Fatima. This is the generosity of Amir al muminin A person comes to Medina, he looks around everywhere. Everywhere. Asking for food, asking for, for money. Nobody gives him. Until a man tells him, you see that home, go to that home. You will find what you need here. Don't waste your time. He said, whose home is that? That is the home of Hussein ibn Ali. So he went and he knocked at the door of Hussein. Imam Hussein came while he was coming to open the door. He said, who is behind the door? He said, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I am a man asking for money. 
So Imam Hussein said, hold on. He went back. He got him the money, 100 golden dinars, and he cracked the door. He didn't open the whole door. He said to him, Khudha, Khudha, take it. فَإِنِّي إِلَيْكَ مُعْتَذِرٌ And I apologize, this is all I have. Khudha, فَإِنِّي إِلَيْكَ مُعْتَذِرٌ وَعْلَمْ بِأَنِّي عَلَيْكَ ذُو شَفِقَةٌ And know that if I had more, I would have given you more. This was Hussein ibn Ali. Couple of years ago, when I was in Houston, I was invited to visit one of the mega churches in America where Pastor Jewel Osteen speaks, he preaches. Probably some of you have heard him. So I went there, I met with him, and as he was giving me a tour of the mega church, he said to me that we raise $2.4 million from the basket, from the donation basket, every month. We raise $2 million from the donation basket, people coming in and out, throwing donations. And we also get another 2 to 2.5 million dollars from outside donations, outside our church. And then he took me to a, an area, a huge area, and there were boxes. And in the boxes was Christmas time. In the boxes there were toys, Game Boys, food, shoes, clothes. And I said to him, what are those boxes? He said, we will... Purchase different things for children. We put them in those boxes and we ship them to Iraq, to the poor people. To Iraq. But yet we call ourselves the followers of Amir al Mu'mineen. He is the commander of the Mu'mineen. He is the commander of the faithful. And we call ourselves the Mu'mineen, the faithful. Yes, of course, many, may Allah bless them, they are generous. But unfortunately, when we don't have anything left, you know, when we have the shoe that we've worn and it's, it's ripped up and the pants that's wrinkled and, for example, things that we don't need and we happen to go for ziyara, so we say, well, let's take this for the poor kids there. We give it to them, the poor people. Instead of giving this to the Salvation Army, we take it too. Amir al muminin taught us generosity. And yet, we have to learn from Amir al muminin generosity. And we have to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the money that we spend for Him does not decrease from my wealth. Not just for Allah. Any money that is spent and seeks the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's a vast category. Whatever seeks the pleasure of Allah will not decrease from my bank account. This is something I have to understand. I have to live with every day. Allah saw, uh, uh, excuse me, Ibrahim once was gone with his sheep. He was a shepherd. So he saw a man, he was standing and he was saying, Ya Allah, Allahumma rizqni min rizqika al-halal. Oh Allah, give me from your rizq. So Ibrahim said, this man all the way in the desert must really come here for dua. He's not showing off. Ibrahim, Ibrahim had a thousand sheep. So he came to him, he said, listen, I saw you doing this dua, and I have decided to give you half of my wealth. Take 500 of them. The man said, thank you. Then again, he raised his hands. He said, oh Allah, give me from your rizq. Ibrahim, again, he felt this man has iman, so he gave him. He said to him, again, take another 250. The man continued, oh Allah, give me more. Again, he gave him another half. And until the story says, the tradition states, that Ibrahim was left with two sheep. So he said to the man, you know what? You can have everything. I don't want it. The man turned into the angel Jibra'il. And he said to him, Ya Ibrahim, you have passed the test of Allah. Allah doesn't need your wealth. Allah doesn't need your money. Allah tests your love for him versus the money. And for us, many of us, let us, let us go and examine our, exist, our, our hearts. What do we love more? Do we love Allah more? Or the Benjis? So another ritual that Islam came 
and emphasized on that was part of the Arabic tradition was generosity. But the Arabs also had bad rituals and bad practices that Rasulullah had to come and fight and eliminate. Amongst them was the fact that they would bury their daughters alive. One of the famous companions says, Allah gave me ten daughters. Ten. Nine of them, I buried them at birth. The tenth one, I was traveling. So I came back and my wife said to me that the child was born. I gave it to my brothers and they buried her. He said, 15 years after that incident, one time I went home and I saw a beautiful young girl next to my wife. I said to her, who is this girl? She said, this is your daughter. 15 years ago, my brothers, my family took her and they never killed her. So she is alive today and she's come home. Aren't you proud to see her? He said, yes, I'm very happy to see her. In fact, tomorrow I'm going to take her on a little trip to show her the city. He said, the next day I took her. I took her and I went out to a remote location. I began to dig a grave. She said to me, what are you doing, father? He said to her, hold on, you'll see. He said, after I dug the grave, I threw her in the grave and I began to shuffle back. And I saw her begging for her life, pleading for mercy. And all I could do is just to bury her alive. This was part of the rituals of the Arabs. Rasulullah came to fight that. Another bad ritual within the Arab society was their disrespect for women. Women were not just second class citizens. They were treated worse than slaves, sometimes worse than animals. And Islam came and said the women that are inherited, women would be inherited. So if a man dies and he leaves back a house, he leaves back cattle, he leaves back wealth, also his woman will be inherited by his eldest son. His eldest son inherits his stepmothers. The women that were inherited, now inherit. The women that have no opinion and have no role in society now can go and seek education. طلب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم ومسلمة They can go and seek education. In fact, Rasulullah chose a representative of women to represent the entire Muslim woman and the delegation of Najran. When he went to meet the Christians, قُلْ تَعَالَوْ نَدْعُ أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ And on that journey, and that delegation, he took Fatima to Zahra to represent the Muslim woman. And amongst the bad rituals and practices within the Arab culture was the superstitions, or the superstitions within their cultures. And of course, superstitions belong to every culture, and they exist until today. For example, in the Persian culture, there are superstitions in regards to guests. They say if you get a guest at home, and this guest is taking too long. You know, instead of half an hour, hour, two hours, three hours. So if you want to get rid of the guest, for the guest to leave, you go and you sprinkle some salt in their shoes. And this is supposed to have some magnetic waves to get the guest out of the house. So when they come and they're about to leave, if you want them to come back and reach their home safely, reach their home safely, and then return to you as guests, you pour water behind them. <clears throat> but if you want them not to come back, and not to make it home safely, then you take a small pebble, and you throw it when they leave. This pebble is meant to be an email to Israel. <laughs> Likewise, there are many superstitions, for, for example, in the Arabic culture. The Iraqis in the time of Nikah, when the Nikah is being recited, they say that you have to open your hands. You can't keep your hands like this. Because if you keep your hands like this, then there's going to be a divorce. And many other superstitions in many cultures, and I don't even have time or else the whole lecture will be gone if I went to the superstitions in your culture. <laughs> Islam came to tell us that 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to be aware, wants you to be an alive ummah, wants you to become one unit. Allah in the Holy Quran chapter 2 verse 143 says, وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً We have made you one ummah. Meaning that you have to look beyond your cultures and you have to become one. And today when we go to our community in America, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, we see one community belongs to the Iraqis and one belongs to the Lebanese and one belongs to the Pakistanis and one belongs to... Snajaris. <laughs> While we have to be able to open our doors and welcome everyone, and I tell you this, not just to other Shia, not just to all Muslims, but we have to open our doors for all people to know Imam Hussein, for all nations to Imam Hussein, to know Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein doesn't just belong to us. Imam Hussein belongs to the world, but we have not introduced him the way we should. I remember several years ago from UCSD, University of San Diego, a group of students went to visit the Islamic Center there in San Diego, where my uncle was. And they came and they saw that it was Muharram, so they saw everything is black. After he spoke, he gave them an introduction about Islam, answered their questions. The professor said, Imam, we would like to ask you, why is everything black? So he said, we are, we are in the time of mourning, in the time of Ashura. They said, please elaborate, what is Ashura? So he said, I said, this is my best opportunity. I spoke of the day of the 10th of Muharram, from the beginning to the end. He said, when I reached the story of Abdullah al radi the infant, he said, every one of them were crying. He said, when they left, one of them came, he was Hindu, he said to me, I would like to come back and speak to you. So he said he came the next day and the following day and he came for a month and he came for two months. And after that he came and he said, Imam Sayyid, I am ready to embrace Islam. I am ready to embrace the madhab of Al Muhammad. I said to him, what would you like your new name to be? He had a Hindu name. So he said, I would, what would you like for your new Muslim name to be? He said, I would like my new Muslim name to be Anwar al Hussein, the light of Hussein, because the light of Hussein illuminated my life, illuminated my soul. A Christian poet in Lebanon always, always, all his poetry, when he spoke of bravery, he gave the example of Ali. When he spoke of generosity, he gave the example of Ali. When he gave the example of honesty, he said Ali. So the Christians went to him, they said, what type of Christian are you? Everything is Ali, Ali, Ali. So he wrote this famous line of poetry. He says, لا تقل شيعة غلات علي Don't say that the Shia exaggerate in their love for Ali. لا تقل شيعة غلات علي إن في كل منصف شيعيا for in every munsaf and just human being, Ali must reside. لا تقل شيعة غلاة علي أن في كل منصف شيعيا Then he says, جلجل الحب في المسيحي حتى The love of Ali has boiled in the heart of the Christian. جلجل الحب في المسيحي حتى صار في حبه شيعيا يا سماء اشهدي He says, he, the love of Ali has boiled in my heart so much that with my love for Ali, I have become a Shia. Then he says, Ya Sama Ushadi. Imagine. He says, O skies, witness. Wa ya ardu qurri. And O earth, be a witness. Innani qad dhakartu Aliya. That I have mentioned the name of Ali. Therefore, our responsibility is to be able to take Ahl al Bayt to others, open up our doors to others. And that is why I have chosen to examine this ayah tonight, chapter 2, verse 143. And it has many messages, many important messages. Number one, why does Allah state, وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا We have made you the middle ummah. What does the middle ummah mean? Number two, how do you respond to those 
who ask us of Islamic extremism. Number three, the dangers of extremism within the Shia school of thought. Number four, we will examine the story of Allam al-Majlisi and the Jewish man. Number five, we will examine the Islamic laws in regards to witnessing. Number six, the dangers of accusation. And number seven, who are the ultimate witnesses? Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have made you the middle ummah, the central ummah. What does this mean? The scholars of tafsir have stated that the middle ummah means an ummah that leads the middle route, that does not go to extremes, especially in issues in regards to religion. And today, unfortunately, Islam is being represented by a cult of extremists, by a group of extremists. A recent study of a German university states that the Wahhabi school, the Wahhabi sect is the fastest growing sect amongst the Muslims today. And of course the Wahhabi sect was founded by whom? Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. And Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab was inspired by whom? Ibn Taymiyyah. A hate-mongering animal. A person that bluntly disrespects Rasulullah. He said, for 40 years I taught in Medina, I never visited Muhammad. He holds on to his stick. And he says, my stick today is more beneficial than Muhammad. Because I can actually use this stick while Muhammad is dead. This is Ibn Taymiyyah. And after Ibn Taymiyyah came Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. And now their school of thought, unfortunately, has been spreading rapidly. Last year, one of the Iraqi officials told me on the 10th of Muharram, on the 10th of Muharram, we got a man with an explosive explosive belt, a strapped bomb. And close to the shrine of Amir al-Mu'mineen, on the 10th of Muharram, he wanted to explode himself and kill the innocent people. He said, they caught him, they defused the bomb, then they began to beat him, obviously. So he began to cry. They said, why do you cry? Are you scared you were going to kill yourself? He said, no, I'm not scared. I was fasting today on the 10th of Muharram. I was fasting. And I wanted to have my breakfast, my iftar with Rasulullah. Now I can't. Killing innocent people in the shrine of Rasulullah's brother. On the 10th of Muharram, he wants to breakfast with Rasulullah. A couple of years ago, I went to Karbala, and I went to visit the orphans. So I went and I saw a group of orphans, four orphans. The eldest one was a girl, 11 years old. And the youngest one was a, maybe a six, seven months year old kid, uh, an infant. So I said to the girl, tell me your story. How did you become orphans? She said, Sayyid, we used to live in Baghdad. And they, we got a death threat. My father got a death threat to evacuate, to leave Baghdad. Because we were Shia. And my father also was the Khadim in the Husayniya. He was Khadim in the Imam Barga. He would serve there. So they kept a special eye on him, making sure that he leaves, so that the door of the Husayniya is shut. So she said, my father didn't care. And one day they went inside the Husayniya and they shot him dead. So she said, we were very scared. The next day my mother was taking us to school. And they came in the middle of the street and they shot my mother dead in front of our eyes. She fell in the street. She said, I ran back to the house, to my brothers, to my siblings. And I called my uncle, I said, my mother has been shot, come. He said, it took him some time to come, it was Maghrib. By the time you went to the location, I saw that the dogs had attacked the body of my mother. She said, Sayyid, I had to see that with my own eye. 
said, we brought the body home and my infant sibling, the six-month-year-old kid, he would see my mother and he would cry. And until now, he's scarred. This is the result of the teachings of the Wahhabi school of thought. And today, now you just heard the people being murdered in Pakistan, receiving death threats on the phone. If we are asked in school, if we are asked by an employer, if we are asked by a friend, what do you have to say about the Muslim extremist? We tell them chapter 2 verse 143. Allah speaks against extremism. But we also have extremists too, huh? We also suffer from extremism. Several years ago, I was in a community... And after my lecture, they began matam. So I saw a young man. He took off his shirt. Very big guy. He took off his shirt and he turned around and I saw he has two tattoos on his back. And that wasn't the problem. One tattoo said 50 cent. And the other one, Tupac. And he was wearing a golden earring. I'm not kidding you. And in the time of matam, he was beating his chest very heavily. Afterwards, he passed next to me. So I held his hand. I said to him, brother, the earring that you're wearing is gold. It's a golden earring. Do you take it off in the time of salah? Because your salah is not going to be accepted. He said, Sayyid, uh, I don't pray. I said, you don't pray? He said, no, I don't pray. I said, but you just did two hours of matam. Your chest is almost bleeding. He said, yes, that's enough. Isn't that enough, Sayyid? Isn't that enough? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said, Inni tarikun fikum thaqalain I am leaving two weighty things amongst you. The Qur'an that sometimes we neglect, we do not recite, we do not understand, wa atrati, and I have left my family amongst you. But not for us to make Imam Hussein who we want him to be. I want Imam Hussein to be what I desire him for what I desire for him to be. Someone that I come ten nights for and I do matam and then he's gonna take me by the hand and inshallah everything is gonna go smooth. We are not what Imam Hussein wants us to be. We want Imam Hussein to follow me. I don't want to follow Imam Hussein. I want Imam Hussein to be who I want him to be. But I don't want to be what Imam Hussein wants me to be. <clears throat> and this is very dangerous. This is a dangerous notion that may exist in some communities and amongst different individuals. And we have to know that Rasulullah, Imam al-Sadiq especially, and the time of his death, when he gathered his companions, his friends, what did he tell them? What did he tell them? لا تنال شفاعتنا our shafa'a does not reach whom? لا تنال شفاعتنا المستخف بصلاته Those who do not give importance to their salah. Importance to their salah. And there are other wajib activities, not just salah. Salah, fasting, hajj. Many people, time of hajj comes. It's wajib for you to go this year. This year you have enough money, you have to go. No, say it. This year, it's very busy. I can't leave the business. Hajj, hijab, hijab. Many sisters, they think that they have the time of the day, they can wear the hijab in 10 years from now. What's the purpose of hijab when you're 60 years old? In fact, the ayah says when you become 70, 80, you don't have to wear hijab. But that's when they choose to wear hijab. Because now the hijab at that age is a form of beautification. Therefore, we have to seize the opportunity and we have to understand the fact that we have to be what Ahl al-Bayt want us to be. And we do not make Ahl al-Bayt what we desire for them to be. Another notion that sometimes may exist in our community <coughs> is the fact that when people become religious, they think that they should isolate themselves from the world. They think that they have to boycott everyone, excommunicate everyone. Why? Because I am religious now. I should not affiliate myself with those people. They're not religious. They're not as religious as I am. So there is no reason for me to associate with them. I have my own group. 
Allah speaks against this notion in the Quran. Allah says, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ Speaking to Rasulullah, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ Ya Rasulullah, if it wasn't for your beautiful akhlaq, for your beautiful morals, for your attractive personality, you would not have attracted all of those people around you. You attracted them with your akhlaq. Now Rasulullah attracted many people with his akhlaq. Because the people that were Muslim didn't need to be attracted. But those who saw him from the outside needed to be attracted to him. Amongst them was who? Mus'ab ibn Umar. Mus'ab ibn Umar was 16 years old. He would come with his father to Medina and business trips. He would leave his father and he would go and stand and watch the Prophet. That's all he did. Watch the Prophet. He heard about Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad. So he would go and he would stand and watch him. How he spoke, how he dealt with people, how humble he was, how he always smiled, how attractive his personality was. And Mus'ab began, began to think about Islam. Then he began to interact with Muslims. Then he came to Rasulullah and asked him questions. And then he finally decided that he's going to embrace Islam. So he came one time with his father on the business trip. He went to Rasulullah and he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, I am ready to embrace Islam. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu annaka Muhammad Rasulullah. Mus'ab returned to his father who was the richest man in his time. And he was the only son inheriting all his father's wealth. And Mus'ab was also engaged to the most beautiful girl in his time. And the richest girl as well. His father told him, Mus'ab, either Islam or the inheritance and the girl, choose. And Mus'ab was infatuated with the love of Islam, the love of Rasulullah. He said to him, I will never leave Islam. His father, traditions say his father stripped him off his clothes. He took away everything that this young man had and he threw him in the street. Companions say we were sitting with Rasulullah. Rasulullah said, go and wait on the borders of Medina. This young man is coming without clothes. Go and give him clothes. They said, who is this man? Who is the man that's coming? Rasulullah didn't say his name. He gave his attributes. He said, a man that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet have taken over his heart. Rajulan qad shagafahu hubbu Allah wa hubbu Rasulah. They went and they found the young Mus'ab ibn Umar. They gave him the clothes, they embraced him, and Mus'ab came to Rasulullah. And he became one of the most beloved companions to Rasulullah. He was the ambassador of Rasulullah to many different states. Therefore, Rasulullah's attractive nature, his akhlaq, were part of propagating his message. And now we live. And the days of Ashura, the days of Muharram, it's not the time of celebration, of course. But Christmas is close. And I'm not asking anyone to celebrate. I'm not asking you to go to a Christmas party. And I'm not asking you to go to a New Year's party. But you have non-Muslim neighbors. 10 million Muslims. If every Muslim neighbor was kind to his neighbors, today the people would not think what they think about Islam. Give them a gift, honor them. When they travel, look after their mail. When they travel, look after their home. Be kind to them, be generous to them, invite them over. Smile in their face, change their paradigms towards Islam. With your attractive personality. al Allam al-Majlisi was seen by one of his major students after his demise. So he said to him, Allama, what happened? He said to him, Munkar and Nakir came and they said to me, tell us your good deeds. So I said, I said to them, Bahar al-Anwar, 110 volumes of the words of Ahlul Bayt. So they said, after Bahar al-Anwar, they showed me a very small position in paradise. I said, this is the position in paradise? After Bahar al-Anwar? They said, yes, this is it. He said, I listed another book, small bit of elevation. He said, I gave them another one, another one, another one. And he said, I was not satisfied with the position they were offering me. 
They said, do you have anything else? He said, no, I don't have anything else. He thought, and moments later he said, well, I have something I can share with you, but I don't know how much that's going to help. They said, what is it? He said, one time I was in Isfahan. I came out of my house, and I saw a couple of people beating up some guy. So I went, I said, what's going on? They said, Alama, this is a, a Jewish man. We've given him loans, he's not given the money back. So we're beating him so that he pays the money. So the Alama said, do you have the money? <clears throat> the Jewish man said, no, I, I really don't have the money. They have to give me some more time. So he said, I told the guys, I told the men that I will pay on his behalf. So I took them to my house, I paid their debts, and I told the Jewish man, come and pay me whenever you have time. This is what I've done. Suddenly he saw a boost, elevation, to a grand position in paradise. When we think of Islam, and when we have Islam, we should not think that this Islam should eliminate us from other people. It should create a gap between us and other people. It should only bring us closer to other human beings. It only should make us more merciful and compassionate to other human beings. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ So that you become witnesses upon the people. Now we all know a witness in Islam has to be adil, has to be just. And if a witness is not just and is not adil, what do we do? We believe him? Huh? No. If he's not adil, we do not believe him. Why? Allah and the Holy Quran states, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنْ جَاءَكُمْ فَاسِقٌ بِنَبَأٍ فَتَبَيَّنُوا إِنْ تُصِيبُوا قَوْمًا بِجَهَالَةٍ فَتُصْبِحُوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلْتُمْ نَادِمِينَ O oh, you believers, if a wicked man or a woman, unpious man or unpious woman comes to you with a piece of news, please give me your undivided attention. This is probably the most important part. Comes to you with a piece of news investigate and ask before you accept it. For that will lead, if you do not do that, it will lead you to regret. Why was this verse sent down? This verse was sent down when Rasulullah told a man by the name of Walid to go and collect the Islamic taxes from Bani Mustalaq, a tribe known as Bani Mustalaq. Walid went at the borders of Bani Mustalaq and he returned. Rasulullah said, Ya Walid, why did you return? He said to him, Ya Rasulullah, those guys aren't Muslim anymore. They don't even pray. They don't go to the masjid. They've gone back to the jahiliyyah. And I went to them, I said to them, give me the taxes. They wanted to kill me, so I ran away. <clears throat> so the Muslim said, if that is the case, then we have to go fight them. Rasulullah said, hold on, there's no reason for you to fight. He said, he sent another man, Khalid ibn Walid. He said to him, go investigate. Khalid went, he reached Bani Mustalaq, he saw they have a masjid, they're praying their five daily prayers. And he said to them, I am the messenger of Rasulullah, I'm here to collect the taxes. They gave him the taxes. He went to Rasulullah, he gave it to Rasulullah. This verse was revealed. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu in ja'akum fasiq. If a fasiq, a wicked and unpious man comes to you with a piece of news, فتبينوا. ask, investigate. Don't believe every rumor that we hear. Some people, every rumor that they hear, they believe. Every type of witness they hear, they believe. And they start having different paradigms about people. So if someone comes and tells me, you see that guy? He's not a good guy. I say, really? Okay, he's not a good guy. So I start treating him in a different way, without even knowing the whole story. Someone else comes and tells me, you know what this guy did? He did such and such act. So I believe him. I say, well, that's good. So I start making judgments about this person. This person, for example, so we have a paradigm about different people around us in our community, and 90% of them could be lies, could be rumors. And not only that, 
If we only believe them and that was enough, that's good. But then we actually spread this accusation and rumor. Did you know that this person did and this, did this and this? Or really, who told you? Well, this person told me. Are you sure? I know for a fact. 100%. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, إِنَّ السَّمْعِ What you hear. وَالْبَصَرِ What you see. والفؤاد, where you judge, and your tongue, كل أولئك كان عنه مسؤولا. You will be judged in the day of judgment. You will be asked. Why did you treat this person according to a paradigm that you had that was wrong? Why did you treat him in this specific way? Why did you say what you, say, what you said to him? Why did you act the way you acted with him? Did you investigate? Did you ask? Then the verse says, we have made you witnesses upon the rest of the nation. Let me ask you a question. Now, I can be a witness onto my family. You can be a witness onto your family. Maybe you can be a witness onto your friends as well. But can you be a witness upon the whole ummah? Can you observe the whole ummah? Can any Muslim anywhere in the world say, I am an observant of the whole ummah. I am a shaheed. I am a witness unto the entire ummah. No one. No one can do that. Except one person. Inna anzalnahu fi laylatul qadr. Wa ma adraka ma laylatul qadr. لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٌ تَتَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالْرُوحُ فِيهَا بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ أَمْرٍ Every year and the night of Qadr, every amr, every record, every act, every decision is revealed, is descended onto earth. To whom? They ask Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad in al-Sadiq in the tafsir of this ayah. And he says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. He says, نحن الشهداء, we are the witnesses upon the ummah. Rasulullah, in Laylatul Qadr, the acts and the destiny of the ummah would come to him. And then Amir al-Mu'mineen, and then Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, Ali ibn al-Hussein. Muhammad ibn Ali, Ja'far ibn Muhammad, until Imam al-Mahdi today. He is the witness upon this ummah. And in the day of judgment, they will be witnesses. Allah will ask for witnesses, and Al-Muhammad will rise. They will say, O oh Allah, some people, they observed our love. Some people observed our tradition. Some people observed our teachings and others did not. And we have to be thankful. We have to be thankful that they are a shaheed and they are a witness to this gathering and your endeavor to be here and your sacrifice to be here and your solidarity with Ahlul Bayt because they are the true witnesses. When Fatima to Zahra salawatullahi alayha was pregnant with Imam Hussein. Traditions say that when she reached the last days before her labor, Fatima al-Zahra would cry tremendously. She would weep. The first day she cried and she cried until she fainted. Imam Amir al muminin went to Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, Adrik ibnatika Fatima, come to, your, come to your daughter Fatima, she's cried until she fainted. Rasulullah came, Ya Fatima, why were you crying? Why were you crying so much? She said, Abata Hada al Janin, Yukhatibuni wa yakul an al Atshan. Oh Father, this infant in my stomach speaks to me every day and he kept repeating Ana al-Atshan, I am the thirsty, I am the thirsty. Oh Father, will he be the thirsty one? 
Rasulullah told her Fatima Innahu na'am huwa al-atshan Fatima, yes, indeed he will be the thirsty one. The next day, Fatima to Zahra again, she cried and she wept until she fainted. Rasulullah comes to her, he says to her, Ya Fatima, what's occurred? What's happening? She said to him, Ya Rasulullah, هذا الجنين يخاطبني ويقول أنا الغريب I am the غريب يا رسول الله will he be lonely رسول الله said فاطمة إنه نعم هو الغريب the third day فاطمة cries again رسول الله comes to her he says to her يا فاطمة what's happened she said, Ya Rasulullah, this Janine today tells me an al Shaheed. I am the martyr. Will he be a martyr, Ya Rasulullah? Rasulullah says, Fatima, innahu huwa al Shaheed. He is the martyr one, Fatima. Then Fatima says, Oh Father, will, there, will I be there to cry for him? Rasulullah says, Fatima, you will not be there. Will his father, Amir al Mu'mineen, be there? His father will not be there, Ya Fatima. Will his brother Hassan be there to cry for him? His brother Hassan will not be there. Ya Rasulullah, will you be there? I will not be there. Then he says, then Fatima says, Ya Rasulullah, then who will cry for my son Hussein? Rasulullah tells her Fatima, سيأتون مؤمنون جيلا بعد جيل ينصبون المآتم على ولدك الحسين وإن للحسين حرارة في قلوب المؤمنين لا تنطفئوا أبدا he says, Oh Fatima, there will be mu'mineen, believers, generation after next. They will come to this world and they will do the ma'atam for your son Hussein. They will shed tears for Hussein. And Allah has placed a special fire in the hearts of those believers for your son Hussein. We say to him, Sayyidi, Ya Aba Abdullah. يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجة يا وجيها عند الله يا وجيها The third time for those who are ill, for those who have hajat, for those who have troubles in their family, for those who choose this night to be a night of transformation in their lives. Ya wajihan inda Allah Ya Sayyidi, Ya Aba Abdullah ya, ya. What occurred tonight in the tents of Al-Muhammad? It is the last night when Hussein is amongst his family. It is the last night when Hussein is amongst his uh, beloved companions. Allahu Akbar, on a night like this, Imam Hussein shed the, turned off the lights. And the tents, and he said to his companions, he said, every one of you that's present here tonight, every one of you that is in those tents, tomorrow this army will annihilate every single one of us. I will shut the lights, I will turn off the lights. Whoever wishes to leave, leave. Take the night as a good secretive way for you to leave, for me not to see you. 
After a while, Imam Hussein turned on the lights. And he saw every one of those men, the 72 men standing in front of him, saying to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, ya, 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 ya. we will never neglect you. We will never leave you, Ya Ibn Rasulullah. What will we tell your grandfather tomorrow on the day of judgment? What will we tell your mother Fatima? Then tradition states that Shimr al came near the tents of Imam Hussein and he called out the name of Abu al-Fadl Abbas. Imam Hussein said to him, Abu al-Fadl, do not ignore him, go and speak to him. So Abu al-Fadl Abbas went to him and he said to him, what do you want to tell me? He said to him, Ya Abu al-Fadl, I have amnesty for you. I have amnesty for your brothers. Come and leave Hussein. No one will touch you. He said to him, Khadalatka ummuk. How can I leave the grandson of Rasulullah? Amanun li wa la amanun libn Rasulullah. You're giving me amnesty and there is no amnesty for the son of Rasulullah. Then Imam Hussein went to the tent of his sister Zainab. Allahu Akbar. Saying his goodbyes to his sister Zainab. And on nights like tonight, we remember that infant of Imam Hussein. We remember that infant that he took him on the 10th of Muharram. He came and he said his goodbyes to Zainab. Zainab says, Ya Aba Abdullah, before you leave in the day of Muharram, before you leave. Come and take the six months year old infant. Come and get him some water. Imam Hussein took the infant Ali al Azgar. He took the infant Ali al Azgar. He went towards the enemies. He wore the amama of his grandfather Rasulullah. Carrying the sword of his father, Amir al Mu'mineen, saying, Ya ha ula il qam, in kana then ban lil kibar, fama then buhad al tif. O people, if the, children, if the elders have committed a crime, what is the crime of this infant? Take him and give him a drink of water. They said to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, let us go and ask Umar ibn Sa'd. They went and they told him, Umar ibn Sa'd, Hussein is here asking for water for his infant. What should we do? Umar went and he called out unto Harmala. Harmala came. He said to him, Harmala. Do you see Hussein? He said, yes. Do you see the baby in the hands of Hussein? He said, yes. He said, I want you to hit the arrow in the neck of the child. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Ya Aba Abdullah. Imam Hussein holding on the infant. Suddenly he realizes that the neck of the orphan, there is an arrow. Hussein raised the baby to the skies. He said, Oh Allah, accept the sacrifice from Hussein. Then he took the blood of the baby. He threw the blood of this child to the skies and it did not return. Then Hussein put this baby under his abaya. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. He put the baby under his abaya, going towards the tent of the woman, going towards the tent of Zainab. They say Imam Hussein was ashamed to go back to Rabah. To give her her son. So he went to the tent and he went back seven times. He went back and forth seven times not knowing what he's going to tell. 
as wife. Then he called out Zainab. Zainab came out of the tent. Ya Aba Abdullah, did you give him water? Did you quench his thirst? Aba Abdullah gave the baby to Zainab. She took the baby to her mother, to his mother. Allahu Akbar, she looked at the baby. She began to cry. Then Aba Abdullah, he was the only companion and family member of Imam Hussein that Imam Hussein chose to bury by himself. So Imam Hussein went, he dug a grave for the six month year old infant. Then he buried the infant. He was the last man in the camp of Hussein. Now he comes to his sister Zainab. He says to her, Zainab, bring me my horse. Zainab comes to him. She comes to him holding on the ropes of the Janah. She says to him, Araita Uchtan, Araita Uchtan, Kadamat Leachiha, Faras al Manun, Belahaman Wakafilu. Ya Hussein, have you ever seen a sister give a horse to her brother that's not going to return him? Hussein sat on the horse, he wanted to march towards the enemies. Suddenly he heard a cry coming from the tents. What was the cry? Mahlan, Mahla, Ibn Zahra. All the lovers of Zainab tonight. With Zainab, let us raise our voice. Mahlan, Mahla, Ibn Zahra. Mahlan, Mahla, Mahlan. Imam Hussein stopped and he came down from the horse. He said, Zainab, what do you need? She said to him, Oh brother, face yourself towards Medina. Imam Hussein looked towards Medina. She said, Hussein, lift up your shirt. Hussein lift up his shirt. Then she kissed Hussein on his chest. She looked towards Medina. She said, Oh mother, this is the amana that you asked of me. This is the amana that you required of me. Allahu Akbar, this is a day of Ashura. And after the day of Ashura, let me remind you what happened to this six months year old infant. When they gave water to the woman, suddenly they saw this child's mother running towards the grave of Ali. Ali al Azgar, O oh son Ali, wake up. Now that your mother can feed you, she can nurse you, you're no longer here, Ali. Ya Ali, Ya Ali, my beloved, my child, wake up. They all attack the camp of Hussein, they attack the camp of Aba Abdullah. Amputating the heads of Al Muhammad. One of the Malayin saw that he has no head on top of a spear. What did he do? Allahu Akbar. Sa'ad Allah qalbaka ya Aba Abdullah. He went looking for the grave of that six months year old infant. Ali Janam, Ali Janam, Ali Ajan, Jananam. Those who want to cry with Hussein, those who want to reach their voices to Abu Abdullah, all of us, Ali Janam, Ali Janam. Ali Ajan Jananam Ali Janam Ali Janam Ali Ajan Jananam 
علی جانم علی جانم علی ای جان جانانم All of us all together علی جانم علی جانم علی ای جان جانانم علی جانم علی جانم علی ای جان جانانم شیعتی مهما شربتم عذب ما ان فذکرونی او سمعتم بشهید او قتیل فندبونی علی جانم علی جانم علی ای جان جانانم بر مشامم میرسد هر لحظه بوی کربلا بر دلم ترسم به ما ند آرزوی کربلا علی جانم علی جانم علی ای جان جانانا بر مشامم میرسد هر لحظه بوی کربلا بر دلم ترسم به ما ند آرزو یه کربلا علی جانم علی